We are excited that you've joined us here on YouTube for a great message today that the Lord would use to touch your life. We are excited that you could now subscribe and get several messages that would be, impact your life, whether it is our assistant, Pastor Pierre Cannings, or myself, your Pastor Paul Cannings. And we are glad to serve you. We can also continue this process by not only you subscribing by going to our website. When you go to our website, you could get engaged in our ministries and be able to become engaged in what we're doing here at Living Word Fellowship Church so we get a chance to be a part of your life to grow you. And not only that, we've got a book that would be able to help you to go from spiritual infancy to spiritual maturity. What are the steps? How do you get there? How do you know you're there, what the fruit of the Spirit looks like? These different things will take place when you get engaged in our website and learn more about us and be able to give. Five ways to give when you get to a website, it explains that. And by doing so, we're able to not just touch your life, but the folks at Living Word. We're able to go across the world for the glory of God by those who subscribe like you will subscribe in impacting lives. So join us again. As more messages are rolled out or you go to messages already there, you're able to see God grow in your life because His Word becomes a viable mechanism to not just know Him, but to experience Him. Come back. Let us grow together. Experience Christ in your life so that we experience who Christ is. Not just, I love worship because that's huge to God. As soon as they came out of the wilderness, what does he challenge them to do? Worship him. What did he get excited about David doing? Building a temple to worship him. So God loves worship. He loves worship. He loves being adored and respected, especially when he's doing as much as he does for us every day. So he likes us to reflect on him. But on top of that, he likes us to become like him. He likes us to become like him. Not just reflect on him, highlight him, adore him. Verse 6 says this of Joshua chapter 14. He says, then the sons of Judah drew near to Joshua in Gilgal. And Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and the Kazanite, the Kenazite, said to him, You know the word which the Lord spoke to Moses, the son of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. It was 40 years old. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. I brought the word back to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt with fear. But I followed the Lord my God fully. So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land on which your foot has trodden will be an inheritance to you and your children forever, because you have followed the Lord my God fully. Now behold, the Lord has let me live just as he spoke these 40 years from the time that the Lord spoke this word to, the, to Moses when Israel walked in the wilderness. And now behold, I am 85 years old today. I am still strong today as I was in the day Moses sent me. And my strength was then as so as my strength is now for war and for going out. And coming in. Dear God, your word is blessed. We ask God that you, oh Lord God, that uh, you would guide the exposition of it, the communication of it, and the hearts that receive it. So whatever seeds you plant today, God, it will find fertile soil. We ask this in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Many, many years ago, there's a lot of people who sacrifice a lot for an African-American community to be able to vote, to be able to live in freedom, to be able to live with all the rights that any American citizen can have. They were intentional, and it cost them a lot. Today, they're... they're there's not as much as we have seen in the past. We've had trouble this week when African-Americans jumped on African-Americans. 
to show that their culture has to change because it hurts a lot of good officers out there who are actually trying to do a good job. And we need them because they're the ones running to the gunfire. So we need them. But there's those that make things look bad and cause other people to not trust officers when most of them are good. So you, you have a time when people were intentional, people lined up to go vote knowing they would be verbally abused. People would go off to work in their fields knowing it could be taken. People would build their families knowing that their children can be taken. But they still did. The issue for us today is why are we just following everybody? Whatever the highest hits on social media is, people go down those roads. If somebody has a million hits, oh, this must be hot, so that people chase it. If a movie star comes out and has all kinds of different things as a movie star and we see the, how popular they are, people follow that. It seems like we have come to a generation of just followers. We have no purpose, no drive to make any mark for the next generation. Our generation, what mark are we leaving? What are we accomplishing? The church is the same way. Church gathers on Sunday, it's a big pep rally, but what difference is it when we leave from here? Every football team that huddles, know there's a defense out there trying to tear them apart. Notice the defense seldom huddle because they're responding to the offense. We're, why we huddle on Sunday mornings is for God knows that there's a demon out there, there's a Satan out there trying to tear us apart. He came to kill, steal, and destroy. And if you don't think that's the truth, think of how many people were killed this week. He's a murderer. Think of how many things have become corrupt this week by lies. He's a liar. Think of how many things that have been destroyed this week, whether it's storms, whether it's earthquakes, whether it's whatever, whether it's war. Think of how many of that have happened this week. Satan, the Bible says, he came to destroy. How much destruction have we seen this week in places around the world that have been destroyed? He is busy. He is active. And God knows that he is. And so he's telling us to come together, get our minds set for war. That's why he talks about an armor you put on, a breastplate, a helmet of salvation, a shoes of peace, a sword of the spirit. He's telling us we are breaking huddle to go to war and that he is ready to rock us the minute we walk out the door. He's telling us that. If you got problems on your job, you don't struggle with flesh and blood. You struggle with principalities and powers. Satan is purposely putting somebody on the job to drive you into a job you don't even want, to a place you don't want, to leave something you don't want. So you can put somebody there to drive you crazy so that you, God wants to let that person sit there for you to practice your salvation and be intent about working out your salvation in fear and trembling. But the job is a mess. Why? The Bible says you're not struggling with flesh and blood. You're struggling with people who got, Satan put there to tear you down and God is putting letting them be there to build you up but if we're not intentional we run from this job if we're not intentional we run from marriage we're not intentional we run from relationships we're constantly running why because we're looking for something that God never promised he's telling us we have to fight against the grain the grain out there is Satan doing stuff every day some people are so into the music of the world they can't enjoy the music of church he wants to, to dim the music of the church by creating so many musicians, doing so much good music out there, rapping, singing, dancing, got all the fireworks and everything going. And when you come to church, church music. He so causes us to lose the taste for God that we can't even enjoy worship because it doesn't match up with what we're listening to before we got here. That's one of the reasons why we find church is boring. Church is boring but why? Because we have lost the taste for what God has for us. Because Satan has crowded our space with so much stuff to destroy God's worship service. Why? Because we're not being intentional. We're not being intentional. What am I going to listen to this week? Why am I going to go against the grain as a young person and decide, I am not listening to that. What good does it talk to me about? How does it build me up? Nothing. I'm just bumping along and he's making money or she's making money and I'm getting all excited buying their stuff. And what does it do for me? Give me a moment of happiness. No presence of joy. So I'm just going along with the music. I'm going along with the dress. I'm going along with the clubbing. I'm going along with all these different things. And what am I getting out of it? Sexual diseases. 
What am I getting at brokenness where I don't want to date nobody no more because I'm sick of people, I'm tired of people, I've been in the last relationship. What do we leave with brokenness? Because we're just kind of going along with everything else. And the people that made a difference and became a difference are the people that went, went against the grain. The people that did not follow everybody else, did not go with everybody else was going with. And these are the steps that make somebody develop against the grain. Are we just going to live our lives and end up pointless? What's what the Bible calls vanity and vexation of spirit. We come to the end of our lives and we go, we're frustrated, we're mad. What did I do with my life? I'm sick of this, I'm sick of people, I'm bitter, I'm angry, I'm frustrated. We have all of the residue of Satan's influence on us. Not the spirit of God upon us, which is joy, peace, long-suffering, healthy families, productive results. We don't come back with that at the end of our lives because we come back with the residue of being a follower and Satan driving us into places that are horrible. It's interesting to see rich people killing themselves. Why? Money didn't do it. It's interesting to see people dying at a young age that we once modeled our lives after. All the rap people and all the different people dying at a young age from overdoses. If all of that stuff makes something, why are they dying from overdoses? Because we just followed the tunes. We followed the world. And it brings us that residue that we can't control. And that's why right smack dab in the middle of a wilderness, smack dab in the mi middle of bringing these people, God shows them the residue in order to drive them to go against the grain. What do I mean? What is the residue? The residue is that for 40 years, their mother, their father, their uncle, their aunts, their brothers, their sisters died. For 40 years, they kept dying over and over again. There were so many people dying. Moses left his, sent his wife back to her father. He couldn't keep up. There were so many people dying. For 40 years, they had death after death after death. God has sustained them in the wilderness. And everybody that is now in the promised land have made it through Jericho on God's structure. God walked them around the city. God created a worship service and tear down the walls. God did not have a, a war strategy. He had a worship strategy. And the worship strategy led them to now gather at Gilgal. At Gilgal, this guy Caleb stands up and says, let me show you something. Well, now understand, Caleb is 80 years of age. That means, that means something. Why is he 85 years of age? What does that mean? It means that Caleb came out of Egypt. He was one of those that came out of Egypt. But because Caleb decided to go against the grain of 10, 12, 10 spies, and he said, I'm not going to do what you 10 spies are saying. God promised that when we go into this land, we will take the land. God said that we're going to be able to make it in the land. Our God said that we'd be able to get this thing done. And I am not going to go with these 10 spies. I am not going to say what they're saying. I did see the, 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 the military the way they are. I did see these valiant warriors. I did see that they were tall. I did see that they have a strong city. I did see that they have long, tall walls. I did see all those things, but my God said that we could take this land. The first thing about being intentional is to believe that God's word is able to do exceedingly abundantly all they could ever ask or think. That's the first thing. We, if, if we keep trying to use our own understanding, our, own, our feelings, and all these different things, that's what we live in. Our feelings, our own understandings, and it takes us to the residue that we don't like the pain of bad relationships, the residue of frustration, trying to make it on a job and quitting one to go to the next one because we're sick of these people, the financial stresses that life brings. We have those residue because we have not. We've heard the word, but like the people in the wilderness who believe the ten spies, we don't do it. We don't do it. They heard the word. They see Moses having a, a smoke coming down over the holies of holies. They saw all of that. They saw smoke coming down over the holies of holies when the, when the animals were being consumed. They saw all of that. They saw the ground open up and swallow people. They saw that. They wanted meat. They saw God give them meat. They wanted water. They saw God give them water. Every day we see the rain fall. We see it stop. We see God turn the sun, the moon. We see the earth spin. We see the power of God. But to believe in God when the giants are tall and to walk towards the giants intentionally when the giants are tall, that's the issue. When the giants of loneliness is there, when the giants of marriage is there, when the giants of money is there, when the giants of job issues are there, when the giants are upon our lives, are we going to believe God when he's not making no sense? That's the issue that makes us go against the grain.
Here's the first thing you learn in verse 6 of, of Joshua chapter 14. He says, Joshua, Joshua so believed God that he's going to hold God to his word. That's the first thing you would see in this passage. He held God to his word. In verse 6 he says, Then Joshua, the son of, of Judah, drew near to Joshua in, I mean, jo Joshua in Gilgal. And Caleb the son. Now watch this carefully. Caleb, they're all gathered in Gilgal. Why? They've made it through the walls of Jericho. They've defeated one army after the next. God has proven himself this way. How many people have died? No record that anybody died. They have made it to Gilgal. Caleb said, uh-uh, we can't go any further until you reckon with what God promised me. You know how many times I go to God like that? When in my prayer life, God, you said. God, you said. God, you said. That if I do these things, you will do this. God, you said. That if I abide in your word, you will grant me the desires of your heart. God, I've abided in your word. Here is my desire, and I trust you to provide it. I don't know when you will do it, but I believe you will do it because you said you will do it. And God, I'm holding you to it. Many of us go to pray to God and ask God for things he ain't never said. God ain't never promised you what some people ask for. Some people know the person and save and talk about God. This must be the man you promised me. God ain't said that. If he is saved, he's saved. If he ain't saved, he's not saved. Some of you young people say, God, you promised me a great time if I go to church. God didn't promise that. God didn't promise. God says when you come to church, you come to church for me, not you. I ain't promised you that. Well, I got saved, so God is going to bless me. No, I said you will get saved and work out your salvation in fear and trembling, and then I will bless you. Abide in my word. If you don't abide in my word, you come to nothing. If you accept my word, you're blessed to have everything. It is a working it out to gain the blessing. So many times when we come to God, we are not holding God to his word. We're holding God to our words, our desires, our passions. And then we get disappointed and God is going, you're disappointed because you held yourself to something I never promised. Here's the second thing you see. Joshua, uh, Caleb showed up. And Caleb is saying in verse 6, you know the word which the Lord spoke. In other words, Joshua, you stood there, I stood there. We both heard what God said. So you are here at 85 years, whatever the age Joshua was, and the age of Caleb is 85. And the only reason that we are standing here alive is the evidence that God kept his word. So, so now we know. In other words, now we've experienced the fact that God is true to his word. Oh, folks, oh, come on with me now. May, many of you know where you used to be. You know you used to, be, used to be clubbing. Some of you know you used to be on drugs. Some of you know you need to be on alcohol. Some of you know you've been doing a bunch of stuff that God has said, but God kept you. He watched over you. He protected you. He did a lot for you. So now that you are right here, how do you not know the word of God works? How do you not know it works? I mean, how many times has he kept you when you've been driving around? How many times have you been sick and he woke you up? How many times have you been asleep and he got you going? How many times you live in a raggedy neighborhood and your house didn't get broken into? How many times you've drove a hoop tee and God kept it going? How many times have your kid gone out the door and God brought them back safe? How many times did that happen? How do you not know? How do you not know? That, that, that's the reason why he is saying, now I can move forward against the grain because I know. Well, what, what did David say? David said, I saw a lion. I killed a lion. I killed a bear. So I can stand in front of Goliath because I know. See, we saw, sometimes we don't believe God because we forgot what we know. We forgot what God has done. We forgot how good he's been. So when we're facing difficulties, we want to bring God down to our level when God is saying, keep me high. Don't bring me down to your level. Keep me high. Joshua says, I know. I'm standing here at 85. I went to the promised land. I fought through the walls of Jericho. I fought through all these cities. And I'm standing here. That's evidence that we know. Here's the next thing you find. And it comes to just holding to God's word. So you go against the grain. Young people, you got to learn to go against the grain. Just don't follow everybody. Question I used to tell my sons all the time. Uh, I was terrible with this. 
God forgive me, but I was. They would come home and they would say, Dad, everybody's wearing Jordans. I said, no problems. Everybody's wearing Jordans. By God's grace, the principal at Jersey Village knew me so well that I could go and sit with them and walk around the school from time to time. So I said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to come up to Jersey Village High School, and I'm going to walk the hallways. And if everybody got on Jordans, I'm buying you the tomorrow. I said, Dad, it ain't, it ain't like that, Dad. It ain't like that. I mean, most of the people. Well, I come, to, I come to the school, and if most of the people got Jordans on, I'll buy you Jordans. It's done. It's a wrap. It's, it's a wrap. We get it done. I said, Dad, well, come on, man. I just want to get some good shoes. I said, well, we can go to Conroe, and we can go to the outlet mall in Conroe, and we'll buy the best shoe we could buy at the outlet mall. Why? Because this is our budget. I'll never forget driving up to the school, and my car was a blue, was a blue Taurus, and the paint was falling off the top. Well, it wasn't falling off. It was off the top. It was blown off the top. And my son asked me, why don't you park down the street? Because I'm your dad. I got a bougie son. I can tell you which one. They so parked down the street. Dad, why don't you park down the street? Because I'm your dad. So you don't want me to come pick you up? He says, oh, God, I shouldn't have told you that. I said, yep, you shouldn't have told me that. Because right now, I'm going to be in the line in the front of the line. Because this is what our family could afford. This is what our family has got. So you shouldn't have told me that. They learned never to tell me stuff like that anymore. Because I'm in the front of the line, and I'm literally going to honk the horn. Honk, honk. I'm here. I'm the worst. Don't tell me that. Why? Because God blessed us with this. God has given this car to run. It may be a hoop tee, but it is hooping along just fine. You better get up in this car or you're going to be walking home. There's an option here, you know. You can walk. Many of us are like that with God. We come to God and we forget what he's done. We forget where he's taken us. We're now sitting in homes. We're now sitting on better couches. We're now driving better cars. And we say, look at us. No, look at God and what he has done for you. That's what he's saying. You can't forget the goodness of God when you're faced with the problems you face now. Because if you forget the goodness of God, all you're seeing is your problems, not his goodness. So you got to look back and see his goodness when you look at the issues you face so that you remember the goodness of God. So the problem you face puts more God in it than your feelings in it. That's what Josh was saying here. Look at me now. Look at me. Look at, verse, look at verse 7. He says, And I was 40 years old when Moses, a servant of the Lord, sent me to Kadesh Bernia to spy out the land. I brought back word. I brought word back to him. And it was in, look at this carefully, my heart. It was in my heart. It, it, doing God was a passion. Doing God was a passion. Doing God was not a worship service, a religion. It was a passion. It was very personal. It was something I believed in, I trusted him in. It wasn't just something a preacher told me to do. It was something I want to do. All Moses did when he preached was direct me what word to do. But once I got that word, I'm going to go do it with all my heart. And that's how he came to know. That's how he came to have an experience of God and the ability of God because when he said it, he put his passion into it. You know, unfortunately, we had to give our people a chance. So we didn't win last week, the Cowboys. Because <laughs> we had to give everybody else a chance. I mean, we ate Super Bowl appearances and five wins, you, you got to give, there's 26 teams in the league, so we're at that point to come back. But we have to give everybody a chance. So since we beat the Eagles several years now, it's their chance to take a shot, okay? Today, there's a lot of people in the stands today that weren't there all year. Are you feeling me? It's like if you go to the Texan games, you could pick your seat. <laughs> yeah, you're feeling me right now. When, when I got a ticket, somebody's gracious to give me a ticket. When you get a ticket and you're able to change your seat in the game, 
In other words, you're up here, you could walk your way all the way down after halftime, you know ain't nobody showing up. So you walk your way down after halftime, and you could enjoy the game like you spent a lot of money because ain't nobody there. But if the Texans, if the Texans, if the Texans, if, maybe if, kind of maybe, get anywhere to a winning schedule, the stands are packed. The people who have a passion were there when nobody was winning. It, they had a passion. They would be there. They put on their clothes. They're still doing all the stuff in the parking lot, tailgating, all this other stuff. They wear their gear to the game. They scream. They shout. And they do all of this stuff because those people believe in their team when nobody else did. That's passion. Josh was saying, I was a slave. For a long time, taking bricks to somebody else's pyramid. A long time, I live in a mud hut. A long time, I hear about this God, and I believed in this God. He originally, his tribe originally were not Jewish. His tribe originally was belonged to the Kenizzites. The Kenizzites willfully decided to be a part of Judah tribe. They willfully decided that this is a place we need to become, and they became a part of the tribe of Judah. Josh was saying, I went through, the, Caleb said, I went through the Red Sea. Caleb says, man, I walked around in that wilderness like everybody else. But when I start seeing God open up a Red Sea, when I start seeing what God is doing with this man Moses who had a stick in his hand, when I start seeing manna falling from heaven, when I start seeing a cloud coming on over the holies of holies, when I start seeing God coming over the tent of meeting, when I start seeing this God come alive, and now I'm experiencing him, you can't tell me to go into a land and change my mind against people in a land when I see the power of God operating every day. So it became my passion. I didn't need a lot of people in the stands. I didn't need a lot of people going, this is my team. I didn't need a lot of people supporting this team. It was just two of us, Joshua and Caleb, saying, go into the land. Two is good enough. We are going. See, many of us follow God when everybody else is. God is saying, if you go against the grain, you can't wait for everybody else to follow me. You have to follow me based on how I've been for you. I took care of you. I woke you up. I watched over you. I kept you. You know who I am. You've seen who I am. You've seen how I function. You know what you used to do, and I forgave you of your sins, cleansed you from all unrighteousness, fixed you up, and stood you back up again. You know what I've done. So when I tell you to do something that doesn't match up with what you like, why does somebody got to convince you? It should be the passion of your heart right now to go do it. That's what Josh, Caleb is saying. Caleb is saying that, man, I got a passion for this. I don't care what they say. I want you to go back with me to numbers. I want you to see his passion. I don't want you to stay there because we're going to go back there again in numbers. Chapter 3. This is what is lacking in the church today. People got word but no passion. You know, people could go shopping for four hours, eight hours, and pick a. And at the end of the day, you want to know what did you do? You came out with just a little bitty. Okay, I'm not trying to talk about nobody, but there's some people. My wife is not a shopper. Hallelujah. Praise you, God. You're a good God. My wife is not a shopper. She's just not. When she's shopping, she's going somewhere, and her husband and her are going, she's trying to, trying to look nice for her husband. My wife is not a shopper, but I know some shoppers. Oh, sweet Jesus. Eight hours in a mall. They convinced my wife to go with them. And my wife says, would you come with me? So I guess I need to be Christ, so I got to die. I went to this mall, eight hours. Wrong person, horrible person. I, so I'm walking up to these people going, okay, let me see what y'all bought. Because I, I left the party and started looking at a TV in the middle of a, gas, a glass case with a nice little book. So when they're coming out the mall, I'm going, what did you buy? I mean, y'all have been in here for like seven hours. Oh, hey, this is what we bought. One bag. I opened the bag. A candlelight holder. That's all you could buy? After seven hours in the mall, you bought a can Paul, listen to me. This is what we bought. That's why folk don't like black people coming up in here. 
I must say I said that. Forgive me, but I know not what I said. Y'all just bought a black. Okay. That's passion for shopping that she said was therapeutic. Go swimming. Go jogging. Do something that's more therapeutic than to sit around in a mall. That's how some of us could be. We could have a passion for things. And you see the energy, watch this carefully, the drive, the conviction, the determination. That's what I want you to see in passion. The drive, the conviction that leads to determination. When those three things aren't there, we like it. We're not passionate about it. Here's what you see. In, in, in Joshua, in, in, back to Numbers, in Numbers chapter 13, in Numbers chapter 13, they've just come out of the pro promised land. These spies have been in there. They turned the hearts of the people against what is taking place. And here is Caleb. The first person to talk was Caleb, not Moses, not Joshua. It was Caleb first. This is what he says. Then Caleb quieted the people. Because the ten spies got them all worked up, got them going crazy. You know, the people are just going crazy. They tell them about the Am Amalekites in verse 29, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites. They tell them all these Canaanites, all these people are powerful and great and everything else. And Caleb rises up and says, Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, we should by all means go up and take possession of it. For we will surely overcome it. Are you crazy? They just got you telling you of people who are fighters. The Amalekites, the Hittites, the Canaanites. These people are mighty fighters. And you talking about what? Caleb says we must go. That's passion. Passion has to do with when, when, when a person is passionate, you will see the drive. You will see the commitment, the determination. There's nothing, the conviction, there's nothing that would move them away from sitting there in the seats watching their team lose every Sunday. They'll still be there. That's what's lacking inside of us that don't drive us against the grain. If God don't bless us in the city, bless us in the fields, in two seconds, we're out. If we pray to God and ask God to do something, he did it in two seconds, we're gone. This man waited 40 years. Depend, watch this carefully. He didn't sin. He is walking around in a wilderness because other people sinned. He is dealing with their punishment for 40 years. Accepting their punishment for 40 years because he believes that God is going to take him into the promised land because God said so. That's passion. I'm going to keep living. I'm going to keep doing what I got to do. It's not when the God got to come right away because I'm already totally surrendered to do it the way God said to do it. So God don't have to come right away because I know he's going to come because I know he's God. That's passion. The team keeps losing and you're still going, go Texans. Bunch of cowboy fans says, next year. Been saying next year for 30 years. That's passion. And the church today lacks it. That's why experiencing God is not what you're experiencing. And then you start faking out on God. Where's God? Why is this happening to me? God, why are you not doing this? All this church services, what's happening? Why? Because God can't find passionate people that will walk with him against the grain. It was hard for the disciples. Twelve men, they bounce on Jesus Christ attached to the crucifixion. They walked off. Why? Christ is saying, Peter, back to passion. Do you love me? Peter, you got to love me to follow me. Passion against the grain. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the high priests think different, Peter. They think I'm this. They think I'm that. Who do you say that I am? You go against the grain because you believe my word and that I will never lie to you. Go to Hebrews chapter 6, chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. You have to believe that God's word, God's word is true. And you cannot let God's word lay down. But you got to get the truth.
You got to study it for yourself. That's why you got outlines on the internet at this church. Come to Bible study. There's stuff written for you. You got to make sure it's the truth. Check it out for yourself. This church is not into because the preacher said. No, the word, because the word of God says. Check it out. Check it out for yourself. We write stuff down. We give you outlines you could follow. In Hebrews chapter 11, look at verse 6. This is what it says. Without faith, it is impossible. Look at verse 18 first. We get back there. Satan, he says, he says, no, verse 6, he says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who seek him. That's what the Bible teaches. Look at chapter 6 of Hebrews. Look down to verse 18. Chapter 6 of Hebrews verse 18. So that by the two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. Are you hearing me? It is impossible for God to lie. He says, he, we who have taken refuge would have a strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us because it's impossible for God to lie. God is truth. Not, not he tells the truth. By his very nature, he's the truth. Water is wet. By its very nature, it's going to get you wet. Jesus Christ is the truth. By the very nature, that's all he could tell. Now, I want you to go to John chapter 8. So when, when, when I'm passionate about this word, when I'm passionate about what it says, guess what I'm doing? I'm depending on somebody that it's impossible for them to lie, and then they reward me for holding to the faith. They reward me. So that's why he says in John, he says, chapter 8, he says this. He says, Satan is a liar and there's no truth in him look at verse 44 he says for you are your father of your father the devil and you want to do the desires of your of your father this is the pharisee said he's talking to he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because he there is no truth in him Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature. For he is a liar and the father of lies. So anytime we close this Bible and we say, man, this God stuff, this God stuff, man, I, I, you know, I'm just going to do what I feel I need to do. And what I feel I need to do does not line up with what God is saying. I believe the lie. Jesus is the truth. Satan is a liar. There's no middle ground. There's no moderate view. It's either liar or the truth. Joshua said, I, Caleb said, I accepted God as truth. I am totally convinced that he's telling the truth. And no matter what you say to me, I'm going to do what God says to do because I know it's the truth. I watched him say, Moses, do this. It worked. I watched him open up the Red Sea and it worked. Everything he said, I'm going to send you manna. It happened. I said, it's going to come down and build me a tabernacle and then I'll come down over it. It happened. When I look at everything he said, I don't care what giants are in the land. I believe he's telling me the truth. And to go any other way is to believe a lie. That's what leads to the passion as well as that conviction. See, you got to come to a point in your life where you see that whatever God has told you, he has done it. So it doesn't matter the giants you face, how high they are, how difficult it is, how powerful they may be against you on your job, how difficult they may be in a relationship, how difficult it may be in marriage, how difficult your money may be. You got to believe what the Lord is saying that he said, and you got to trust that he's saying it because he cannot lie. He's known nothing about him that shows he could lie. He said he's going to die on a cross. He did. He said he get it from the grave. He did. Joshua believed in him because Joshua said he can't do nothing but the truth. So I don't care how big the giants are. We drop God's word to our feelings. That's what you see here now. What you see here is that when our feelings pop up, we drop God. 
We have to remain faithful. Look at verse 7. We got to remain faithful because our feelings get the best of us. You say, where well, you see that? You see that in verse 8. Nevertheless, my brethren, he didn't hate the people that turned against God. He said, they're my brethren who went up with me and made the heart, watch his heart compared to their heart, of the people melt with fear. But I followed the Lord my God fully. They believed this. They let their feelings get in the way. But I decided as Caleb to follow God fully because I'm giving him all my heart. Oh, folks, hey, hey, hey. You know, I gotta, let me park here for just a second. Listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. I want you to go to Joshua. Come on with me. Let's do some Bible study up in here. Look at Joshua chapter 2. The people that they ran from because they were afraid was afraid of them. And they were scared of them. And their hearts melted when they see this nation coming towards them. Their, ha their heart melted. You say, what do you mean their heart melted? You see a nation come through the Red Sea and kill the most powerful army, the Egyptian army, and swallow them up in the, in, in the Red Sea. Wow. We are not bigger and mightier than the Egyptian army. And they killed them. He is like a god in Egypt. And they wiped him out. These people keep going to war and nobody dies. I'm watching these people. Every day of my life, I'm seeing Balaam go to curse them and Balaam can't do it. These people are something special. Oh, you're not following me. When you start to walk with God, you start to stand out. You're not following me. See, you start to stand out. How could your marriage last so long, girl? You stand out. Girl, how could you be single and keep making it like this with all these chilling? You keep standing out. How in the world could you go through what you've been through in your life, and I know what you've been through in your life, and still have some joy in your heart, some, step, some pep in your step? How in the world could you do that? See, you go to work and you start saying good morning and how you could say good morning. I mean, you're so tired of you coming in here with your mouth wide open talking about good morning. Did you see it's Monday morning? Oh, thank you, Jesus. Shut that stuff up. See, all of a sudden, you start becoming a testimony to God. And when you be start becoming a testimony to God, God is saying, we're on the right path. We're on the right path because you're saying, God, I'm not afraid of what I'm dealing with. I'm not afraid of how big the enemy may be. I'm not afraid of how giant this may seem. What I'm committed to is you no matter what because I have a passion for you no matter what and it doesn't matter. So, God, I'm going to sing to you if it's crazy. I'm going to clap to you when it's crazy. I'm going to bless your name when it's crazy because you can't lie and you got my back. That's how you remain faithful. You don't depend on the circumstance to determine how you're going to be faithful. You depend, you depend on the goodness of God, the grace of God, the might of God, the power of God. And you know he could never turn his back on you. So you stay faithful because of who he is, not because of who we are. <laughs> Look at chapter 2 of Joshua. Look at chapter 2 of Joshua. He says in verse 9, he says, and he said to the men, he said to the men, this is, this, this is not Joshua speaking, this is not Joshua or Caleb speaking, this is Rahab. I know that the Lord, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I, I wish I had a hoop right here. Here's the sinful person that was prostituting herself on the city wall. But God let her write a verse. Could I get a witness? All because she chose to believe in God. That's the goodness of God. God don't care about your past. He's just happy you want to believe him today. And you're willing to trust him for the future. He don't care what you've been to, where you've been. He cares where you are and where you need to go. That's God. God says, come on, Rahab. Tell them what they ran for for 40 years. For 40 years they ran from this. Tell them, Rahab. Tell them. Here's Rahab. i never forget Mary Madeline in the Bible. She's the one taking the message to the disciples, and she has seven demons, and the disciples who walk with Jesus Christ are gone. She had more passion, a commitment to do what God says, than the disciples who dealt with their fears. Their fears ran them off. Her commitment to God kept her at the tomb. That's what made her go against the grain and got the disciples to believe in Jesus. Walk with me. 
She says, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the terror of you have fallen on us and that all the inhabitants, all, all the valiant men of the land has melted away from you. Now, keep your Bible right there. When you see something, keep your Bible right there attached to this word melted. Keep the Bible right there for this word melted. Are you with me? Watch this carefully. Watch this carefully. He's going to say in verse 8, Nevertheless, my brethren went up with me and made the heart of the people what? Oh, you're not with me right now. The ten spies are sitting around making the people scared. And their hearts are melted. They have walked in this wilderness for 40 years when the people behind the walls' hearts was melted. All because they believed a lie. Oh, you're not with me. Many of us are letting people scare us into doing what they make us afraid to do. So some people say, oh, you don't want to go to church. You get to go into church, you're going to meet some crazy people. And you start meeting some crazy people, you ain't going to want to be there. And so we believe that message and we stay home. Why, when we stay home, we end up wandering through life, can't get the direction we need because we're not hearing the word of God like we need to. And then we struggle because, well, I don't even know who to date. I don't even know how to get out of depression. I don't even know how to get out of this dark hole I'm in. I don't even know how to deal with my finances. I don't even know how to make my marriage work. I, I have a lot of direction I need, so I'm going to social media because now I'm a follower. Social media starts scaring me. Girl, you don't want to do that. You're going to be naked, barefoot. In the kitchen. So they need all this fear. We follow the fear. And we do what the fear tells us to do. When Satan is already saying, oh my God, if they ever pick up the word. If they ever do what God says. I can't corrupt them. I can't destroy them. And I can't do what I want to do with them. If they just pick up this sword that I can't fight against, I can't do nothing with. Because that sword, I, t I went to that sword, I put it on a cross, I nailed it to a cross, and it did get up from the grave. So now I ain't got nothing. I can't give them death because they can overcome death. I can't give them lies because they can overcome the lie with the truth. I can't give them sadness because he's liable to turn around, grow inside of them, and give them the joy of the Spirit. I can't take away their peace because this man will grow inside of them and give them peace. I can't make them weary because he gives them strength to give them strength to make it through difficult times because he who is in them is now greater than me. So if I could just get them away from church and the Bible and the word of God, then I could create fear. You know what? The first time Jesus Christ met Peter, don't fear. Watch it. Luke chapter 5. Do not fear. What caused Peter to deny Jesus? Fear. What does he come to Peter and say? Do you love me? What did he tell Peter? If you love me, you do what? Keep my commands. You cannot lean to your emotions. I cannot lean to yourself. If you love yourself, you will lose yourself. But if you give up yourself for my sake, you will gain yourself. Because fear is such a powerful emotion, it could drive you to believe lies. It could drive you to believe whatever satisfies your feelings and your desires. It could drive you there. But if you choose to do what I say, you're going to have to die to yourself, pick up a cross and follow me, and you got to kill fear. These people suffered for 40 years because they were afraid of people who were afraid of them. Some of us are suffering, broken, and hurting because we're afraid of this and afraid of that. I'm afraid if I do this, this is going to happen. And God is saying, no, 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 drop the fear. That's what, one of the things that would lead you to be faithful. Give up the fear. Give up the fear. Here's the next thing. That would give you strength to stay faithful. Stick with the truth. Stop believing gossip. Y'all love gossip. You know, you know what I'm amazed of? When I go to the grocery store, I've been married 42 years. Do you know what's still at the grocery store, at the checkout line? Gossip columns. And the same names. 
How could gossip columns, I've been married 42 years, make it for 42 years? Somebody buying it because somebody believed in lies. I, I, I look at the titles of those columns and I see that they're the same names on there. It's lying about people. I decided last week to go on YouTube. Let me just see what y'all look at. I was sitting, I, had, I, didn't, I, I was waiting on my car, and the guy was taking too long, so I decided, no problems. let me go see what they look at. There's a whole lot of people that have died that are still living. I saw funerals of people that are dead, gone. Y'all should have seen how many people came. Who's A big lie. And I'm saying, wait a minute, I thought this person was still living. Check, person's still living. I said, what? Then I went to the animal place and I see a bunch of things happening and I'm going, that doesn't exist. I check it. it exist. So on YouTube, if you do YouTube, if you do Facebook, you could end up believing a whole lot of lies. Think about it for a minute. Satan has filled the world with lies. So that when God is speaking the truth, God is a waste of time. You don't know what he's talking about. Don't believe them preachers. That Bible is an ancient text. He got us doing all of that. Why yes is doing all of that? Because he's afraid that if we were to ever pick up the Bible and decide to move forward, God don't care how thick walls are. God don't care how big giants are. God don't care how difficult the problems are because God knows he's able to do exceedingly abundantly all I could ever ask or think. So don't tell me about the problem. Let me fix the problem for you by taking you away from becoming a problem. That's what's sad in this story. It really is sad for me when I read that. They ran away from something that was running away from them. <laughs> you know, I, I, I saw this and I wrote this sentence from it. It says, when Caleb reported to Moses what he saw, he was passionately committed to it despite the obstacles, to willingly do what he had set his mind to do despite the obstacles. Because, watch this carefully, because even though some of the spies relied on circumstances, Caleb saw that the circumstances were a lie and God is the truth. You have to commit to the truth no matter how crazy it may seem. When God speaks, yes, sir. Now, how can I do it becomes how I figure out from my common sense. It's how I do it. Looking for godly advice. Looking for people who can give praying for wisdom. That's when I put my brain to work. But whether or not I believe what I believe, it has to be what God is saying. Watch what he says here. Watch what he says here. He says, I, I brought back to you what God said because I followed God fully. Whatever God tell me to do, I went up and I heard it. I saw the land is flowing with milk and honey. I saw that this land is where he's telling me to go. So as a result of that, God is going to do what he said he's going to do. Why? Because when I went in, he not only told me he is the truth, I went in and I saw the truth. I saw the land flowing with milk and honey. Everything he said about it is true. So we're going to stop going because of some giants? Oh, no. We ain't going to stop going because of some giants. We're going to go despite the giants because what everything God said is the truth. You must stick with the truth. That's how you stay faithful. The minute you turn off the truth, you will not be faithful. Don't believe lies. Here's the last point we're going to make. Y'all know that's not going to work perfectly. Remember that God is for real. Remember that God is for real. Everybody wants to be blessed. I ain't going to even ask you to raise your hand. Everybody wants to be blessed. Everybody. Not everybody. Everybody wants to be blessed. That's no problem. We act like God don't want to bless us. I, I put it like this. Water comes out the pipe. You could turn the pipe on and the water just flows. Or you could get the blessing by coming up under the pipe. It's just choice. The car is in the driveway. You could decide to use the key. Or you could decide to keep the key and leave it in the house. It's your choice. The blessing didn't go anywhere. It's your choice that took you away from it. Watch this carefully. Watch what, how Caleb gets, I call him gangster. Caleb got gangster right about here. I'm serious. I'm serious. 
Pierre called me this week to say, Dad, was I ever a thug? I said, no, boy, shut up. You ain't no thug. <laughs> oh, shut up. <laughs> you ain't no thug. I ain't saying this because he's assistant pastor, but he was always the nicest kid in class. The nicest kid in class. All the teachers loved him. I go up there, you Pierre's dad. I said, don't be loving on my son like that. <laughs> he was the teacher's favorite and all that. So, you know, thug. Look at verse 9. I just messed up his mojo, but you said, right. Look at verse 9. He says, so Moses swore on that day. Joshua was saying, okay, it's time for my blessing. This is what I love about this. When you walk with God, you could say, come on, God. You promise. <laughs> come on, God. You said you're going to do this. You know, I like to go pray like that. Uh-uh, uh-uh, God, you, you said this. You're going to do this, God. I know it be going to be your timing. You have to wait 45 years. It could be your timing, but you said you're going to do this, God. It's in the Bible, God. I'm ready, God. I'm taking the cup, putting it up under, under this pipe. You're going to turn the pipe on when you're ready, but you don't have to look for my cup. It's going to be right there. This is, what he, this is what Caleb is like gangster right here. He says, oh, no. He said, every place I put my feet that I trot, he says, that's my inheritance. And it's not just for me. It's going to be for all, all my kids, all my grandkids, everybody. It's going to go on forever. God going to bless me. This is what he said. I followed. He repeats, I followed him. I went against the grain. I followed him. And I did it fully. So God said, he gonna, this is going to happen to me. He says, look at me. Look at me. He says, now behold, the Lord has let me live. So he's kept his promise thus far. He, well, look at it. He left me live as he spoke 45 years ago. And so J Caleb went through the walls. 45, five years later, Caleb is fighting through the walls, fighting through everybody. And he's got his strength and energy at 85 years of age. Could you see him doing it? Yeah, I hope he didn't run like Biden. Okay, that's not what the comment does this. But, but you, know, see, he, you know, he he's out here 85 years of age, fighting the enemy, killing the enemy, doing the enemy, doing what he got to do. And he's arriving at Gilgal. Look at me. I'm alive. I'm not just alive because he kept his word for 40 years. I'm alive because for five years, years I've been fighting and I'm still here. So God has kept his word. Watch this carefully. Watch this carefully. He says, and the Lord has spoken. I'm here 85 years. I got my strength today like I had it before. So guess what? Give me my land. Give me my land. Oh, folks. <laughs> Go to John 15. Give me my land. And, and, jo and Joshua you were there when he said everything he said. So you were eyewitness. Give me my land. That's what I love. I love, I love you know, there, there's many days I go to God and say, God, you promised. <laughs> you promised. Psalm 120, 12 is one of my favorite passages. Psalm 128, Psalm 112, Proverbs 24. God, you promised. If a man walks right and fears you, walk in your ways, you take care of his kids and his children and you give him life. God, you promised. These people didn't have no medicine, no doctors, no hospitals, no nothing. And he's standing here. Watch this carefully. Look at John chapter 15. Walk with me. He says in verse 5, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can't do nothing. In other words, you, you, you do it for a while, it doesn't work out. You do it for not a while, it doesn't work out. It seems like you're getting, getting, moving down the road a little bit further, and it didn't work out. He said, it does not come out to nothing. Ecclesiastes talks about this clearly. But look at verse 7. If you abide in me, and my words, this is not just to Caleb, this is to us is. This is not particularly just to Caleb. He says, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish. Watch this carefully. And it will be done to you. The word done means, if it's not there, I will create it for you. So, so it doesn't have to be there before you get it. Yeah. It could never be there, and I will still make it for you. Yeah. And watch it carefully. It's not just done for you. It's not just done for you, meaning I put your DNA in it because it is particular just to you. Because you, well, you got, got to see the personal pronouns up in here. If you abide in me, and I abide in you, very personal, I will bless you with the desires of your heart, and I will make it done 
For you. What, what, oh, oh, you don't understand it. I'll make this happen to you because whatever is for you, I'm going to make it particular to you because it's just yours. It don't belong to nobody else because you decide to abide in me. You kept doing what I said. You kept doing every, exactly what I said. You disciples, when people came up against you, you still did what you're supposed to do. You stood at Pentecost. You preached. They beat you up, locked you in jail. You went back to Pentecost and you still preach. You did exactly like I tell you to do. And as a result of that everything I promise to you will get done. You will be in heaven. Twelve thrones available to you because you did exactly like I said. Twelve thrones are not available to anybody else but you. God got a blessing for you. And it is just for you. But you have to decide whether or not with giants and walls and loneliness and pain and heartache and brokenness and money issues and difficult job issues and all the different issues, God, I will abide in you. I will do what you say no matter who's going against me, who's talking negative about me. I will go against the grain. I don't care at school who thinks I am weird, I'm stupid for believing in the Bible. I'm still going to do what God tell me to do because God make me to do it and I know he's going to bless me. He's going to bless me without a messed up life because I didn't make the decisions they made. Going against the grain is your blessing. God is not into what the world is doing. But please do not drop off the word fully. And everything in this passage Caleb did intentionally. I am, I am not going to go with what these spies are saying. I'm going to go into the land. I'm going to tell you the truth. And I'm going to wait 45 years because it took God that long to walk up to Joshua and say, give me mine. I'm going to fight the enemy. Deal with the walls. Deal with the problems. Deal with the heartache. Deal with all the situations because I'm sure his family members died. I'm going to deal with all of that because I know what the Lord promised he will do. And if that means nobody else followed me, only Joshua and the ten spies didn't, so be it. If it means that some people are going to die as a result of the decisions I made because I choose to do what God says, I will go to the funeral, pray over them, do whatever I got to do, but I'm still going back to the promised land to do what God tell me to do. I'm going to be intentional about what God says because that's my blessing. I, and I need God's blessings. I need him to wake me up another morning. I need me to carry along my way. I need him to hold on to my job. When I go for the doctor, I need a miracle when God is working with me. I need God to keep me one more time. I need God to watch over me, to raise me up again. I need God to see my kids go out the door. I need to see them come back in the door. I need to be able to make it one day after the next. I need his blessing. I need God to, when I pray over my food, I need some more food tomorrow. I need God to provide a blessing. I need when I'm standing here on my job and I'm doing what God is telling me to do on my job, I need to find favor and not people to become my enemy. I need his blessing. I need to be able that when I walk with God each and every day and my marriage, it may not be perfect, but God will give me strength to be the person I need to be no matter how the marriage may be. I need his blessing. When a person sees that, it doesn't matter what you face. It only matters who you face it with. Let us stand. I pray that this message touch your life in a powerful way because this is what we're after. This is what we're focused on. That the message would not just impact your mind, but your heart. So that you get to know Christ intimately. He becomes somebody you experience, not just know about. And that's why we want you to subscribe. We want you to subscribe because when you subscribe, when new messages come, it gives you a signal. And therefore you know how to come back on and we grow together powerfully. You go to our website because when you do, you can find out about the book, Disciples in the Making. When that happens, it teaches you how to go from spiritual infancy to spiritual maturity and gives you all the steps to make that happen. So go on to our website and also give to this ministry. When you do, we're able to touch more lives all around the world that tune into this ministry for the glory of God. So you're able to make a definite impact that will change lives for God's glory. So subscribe. That way you continue to be involved and be a part of what God is doing. Not just here at Living World, but all around the world. You touch lives. God bless you. Stay focused.